All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I was going to say tonight, but it uh, really depends on where you are in the world. It's uh, about seven o'clock in, in the eastern US. Um, but thank you so much for attending this info session for our Film and Media Studies MA program. Uh, my name is Julie Dobrow. I'm the Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at the School of the Arts. Um, I am also a proud alum of the Theater Management and Producing Program. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and we'd like to start by doing a land acknowledgement. Um, Columbia University School of the Arts recognizes Manhattan as part of the ancestral and traditional homeland of the Lene, Lenape and Wappinger people. By acknowledging legacies of displacement, migration, and settlement, we are taking a small first step toward the long and overdue process of healing and repair. The School of the Arts continues to confront and address issues of exclusion, erasure, and systemic discrimination through ongoing education and a commitment to equitable representation. Um, just to give you a sense of what the format's going to be for tonight, um, we have several people from the Film and Media Studies program um, who will speak to you, um, two faculty members and a current student. Um, so we'll do a, a brief presentation. I will then talk a little bit about uh, financial aid after that. Um, and then we will open it up for a Q&A. Um, so we will have plenty of time to answer your questions. Um, we ask that you hold the questions until we're done with the presentation, but you can start putting them in the chat uh, at any time. Um, okay, so uh, without further ado, let me share my screen because I have the PowerPoint. Can you all see that? Yeah, okay. All right, so this is me. Um, and I'd like to introduce Ron Gregg, who is the concentration head of the Film and Media Studies program. And I really look like that, don't I? Um, I agree. Like so welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Ron Gregg. I'm the director of the MA program here uh, in Film and Media. And um, what can I say? I think that most of our information is online. But um, as you've probably discovered, there are two tracks. Um, a, a cinema media track, which is um, a focus on what I would consider to be, you know, more of the classic approach to cinema uh, that's uh, looking at film and media, but from the perspective of national cinemas, of genre, of film style, of sound, um, sort of a close analysis. But it's also looking at sort of the shift from photochemical to digital cinema and the various questions that um, this shift, this historical shift causes. Um, as I say, there are two tracks that I'm gonna let my colleague Rob, Rob King talk about emergent media. Uh, but for the cinema and media track, um, you have 30 required credits and um, four required courses. Two of those courses are basically introductory courses. One is a cinema media history course that introduces you into many of the concepts that I just laid out, um, a sense of you know, theory and history um, and a sense of critical studies, uh, some of the major beats uh, that um, lead you into a sense of starting to develop your own thesis project uh, within the program. And then the second course uh, is a pro seminar in film theory that introduces you or discusses recent trends in film theory, film and media theory, um, and sort of get you up to speed to where the field is uh, at this moment. And besides those two required courses, there's only two other required courses that are basically around your thesis. Um, one is your thesis prep seminar where you actually write uh, your thesis paper within the Within this seminar, you share chapters uh, with your uh, cohorts within the seminar. Uh, they read, they give you responses. Um, and by the end of that, you come out with a full rough draft of the thesis. This is in your third semester. Um, and then you have uh, what's called uh, graduate thesis research, which is basically putting the thesis together, doing the research, but then turning in the final thesis. So there's basically six credits that you're getting uh, for your thesis. Um, otherwise, the rest of the credits are electives, uh, and you can take those within film and media studies, but you can also 
uh, step out, you know, of our program and take courses across the campus, um, trying to put together a framework of your particular interest, whether that's in comparative media, East Asian cinema, uh, South Asian cinema, um, or maybe a specific uh, perspective on gender, race, and sexuality, or a national cinema, or a sense of a cross study of literature, art, uh, and cinema. And so you get to put together basically your own program outside of those required courses and develop your framework that you're going to use for your MA thesis. Um, outside of that, um, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Rob Keen, but I'm happy to answer any questions when we get to the Q&A. But also you can easily find uh, my email address and you can email me individually with specific questions that maybe aren't answered tonight. Uh, but I'm happy to answer those. Thank you. All right, Rob, you are up next. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rob King. I'm the uh, Director of Undergraduate Studies uh, at uh, Columbia, um, well, the Film and Media Studies program. And I wanted to say a few words about the stream, uh, the concentration that we have in emergent media. Uh, so Ron was just talking about the, uh, the stream in Film and Media Studies, but we have now for the past, I think, four years, a uh, stream in emergent media where we focus on a range of moving image media outside of what we would think of as cinema, or at least as traditionally understood, uh, in order to explore, well, a, an enormous range of things, whether it's video games, internet of things, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, if you're excited to dig your teeth into the, the implications of uh, artificial intelligence, as it seems that many people are these days, then uh, the emergent media stream is uh, is where you'd be able to do that. Um, basically, in terms of the, like the course structure or the structure of courses uh, that you'd have, it's the, it's the same as for the uh, film and media studies stream, except with different required classes. In your first semester, you'll take an overview of the field of new media art in a class called New Media Art, which I co-teach with Lance Weiler, about whom I'll say a few words in, in just a second. And then in the, uh, in the spring, you'll take a class in media archeology. span uh, Aside from that, we also have a range of other classes in digital storytelling, in world building, in designing for interactivity and so on and so forth that you would take uh you know through the program and you know i would also uh note that we are do we uh can can we share screens is this something i can do i stopped sharing mine so yes yeah, see if you can do it uh let me make let's, you a co-host let's Hold see on. if i can do it okay let's uh let's see uh we also have oh there we go okay uh so we also have um the uh the Digital Storytelling Lab. The Digital Storytelling Lab has become a kind of umbrella for a lot of the initiatives that we do here at Columbia as they relate to new media. Uh, it's an umbrella that includes the stream in emergent media, but it also has an importantly public facing side to it, uh, where, as you can see here, we uh, explore a variety of media. We experiment with prototypes. We have a series of uh, events as well. Uh, every year we have a, um, uh, sorry, every month we have a, a meetup at the uh, Film Society of Lincoln Center where there are guests who are invited. Again, it's public facing, so students attend, the general public attends. Uh, we also have Story IO as a, a weekend uh, event where people will uh, experiment with uh, interactive experiences and the like. So. In other words, the Digital Storytelling Lab helps ensure that you know, the kind of work that you'll do if you do follow the emergent media stream, that it's not just a matter of you sitting at your desk and like doing research into this, that, and the other. Of course, that'll be part of it and an important part as well. Uh, but that you know, there, there are a whole series of public events that open up to you uh, through that and which would be excited to, uh, to participate with you on and hope to see you at. 
Great. Thank you, Rob. So why don't you stop sharing? Uh, all right, I will share again. Uh, let's see. Okay. All right. Um, and next we have We, who is one of our current students. She is um, finishing up uh, writing her, her final paper, even as we speak, but uh, she was kind enough to come and talk to you a little bit uh, today about her experience in the program. Are we? Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is We. I'm a graduating student from the MA program, and I'm in the emergent media track. However, I did take both all the required courses for both tracks. So if you have any questions later on, you can just ask me anything, regardless of your interest. Um, Professor Greg and Professor King already did such an amazing job. So there's really nothing much to add on ex except for, I guess, so what's it really like? Um, honestly, it's, it's, I think it's a perfect place if you're interested in these fields of studies. Um, I was actually, you know, I was actually like in this kind of Zoom meeting last year or two years ago when I was applying and Columbia was the only place that I applied for and I really lucked out getting in. Um, the reason I did that was because the Film and Media Studies program in Columbia is one of the oldest ones in the States. It has amazing resources, not only the academic resources that you could achieve, but really the faculty and the support of the office is amazing. Um, the cohort community, from my experience, it was amazing because you're all in there together around several, like you're all in there together because you all want to study something similar with, with film and media. However, um, coming from my cohort, we all have specific niche and specific interests under that same umbrella. So it's really amazing to see how people really bounce off each other and discuss everything, not only in seminars, but even outside of classes. So people just talk about everything that they know and that they want to know, and it really broadens your perspective. And it really helps not only with your thesis, but just life in general, I guess. Um, the school community is great. Um, there's a lot of events going on in School of Arts and also outside of School of Arts that you could really um, get a hands-on as a Columbia student. And I highly encourage that. We have amazing screenings. We have events going on. We also have the separate building in the 125th Cold Lemfes, and they have amazing events going on. Almost bi-weekly, we have film festivals, um, and of course, New York City, it's located in New York City. And especially if you're interested in film and media, not only in the traditional way, but also in new media and emergent media, there's always so many events going on. Um, our cohort always goes to the New York Film Festival together. We always go to Film Forum together. And there's also a bunch of events and discounts and special screenings that's um, open to Columbia students beforehand. So it's honestly great. And yeah, that's, I guess that's the general gist. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me because I think that will be more helpful. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, We. Okay. Um, so just a couple of uh, logistical uh, pieces of information and then we can go to the Q&A. Um, most important is the deadline, which is uh, February 1st of 2024. So you've got a bit of time, about a month and a half, um, at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So um, the application actually closes after that. So please make sure you give yourself enough time to submit it and, and uh, leave yourself a little wiggle room for any computer issues that may come up. Um, we also have, wait, hold on, there we go. Um, if you want to be considered for scholarship support through the School of the Arts, we have a limited amount of scholarship support, but we do have some for this program. Um, the deadline to submit your application for that is also February 1st. Um, the, uh, we ask domestic students to submit a FAFSA, um, and we ask both domestic and international students to submit, um, we have our own, it's called the School of the Arts Financial Aid Application. Um, and you can actually find that right through the application portal. Um, we ask you to submit both of those by February 1st. Um, but what's really important for you to know is that admissions decisions are made independent of your financial need. So it will not affect your um, likelihood of getting admitted, whether or not you apply for financial aid. So please, uh, if you do feel you need scholarship support, please do submit those applications by the deadline. 
Um, and so what are the forms of student support? Um, number one is scholarships, um, as I was just uh, talking about. Um, it's a limited amount, but we do have some. Um, and it's based on, on a combination of both need and merit. Um, so the faculty admissions committee will rank um, the students that have applied. Um, and then we have um, the need portion, which we determine through the submission of your, um, of your financial aid applications. But know that the faculty committee will not see that information. That is only in the financial aid office. Um, we also have within the School of the Arts what we call service positions, which are jobs within the school. Um, they pay between 22 and 25 an hour. Um, some of them are, are you know, uh, things that are directly applicable to what you're studying. Uh, we have students that are, you know, work in the uh, equipment rooms. We have students that, that are um, up at the Lundfest doing uh, the, the actual screenings. Um, we have students that um, are assisting faculty. Um, so those are positions that you'll hear about when you arrive or maybe even a little bit before. Um, we also have some teaching positions. Um, the compensation is $6,660. Um, and those give you an opportunity to uh, TA for an undergraduate class. Um, there's also federal work study. Um, for those of you who are US citizens and permanent residents, um, the FAFSA uh, application determines whether or not you are eligible for work study. But there are work study positions throughout the university. Um, and there's also other jobs at Columbia that are um, available to both uh, federal work study and also other students, including international students. So international students can work on campus up to 20 hours a week. So that's something um, that you should be aware of. Um, and then we do have emergency aid um, for um, students who are uh, in, in an emergent situation. Um, we have an application for that. It goes through our student affairs office. Um, so those are some opportunities uh, for student support. Um, I just wanted to make sure you know who the members of the admissions and financial aid staff are, because if you have any questions or need any assistance over the next couple months, these are the people you will be speaking to. Um, so there's me. Uh, there's Kenny Wong, who is our director of admissions and financial aid. Um, we have Nequette Johnson, who is our officer of admissions and financial aid, and Toy Sheffer, who is our admissions assistant. So we're a pretty small office, um, but we are all 100% dedicated to helping uh, your experience um, and answering any questions that you may have um, about the admissions process, about the application, or about financial aid. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and here's the contact information. Um, if you have questions, um, you can certainly address them during this uh, Zoom session. But if you have questions afterwards, this is how to reach us, um, soaadmissions at columbia.edu or soafineaid at columbia.edu. We will get back to you as soon as we can. It tends to get a little busy this time of year just because uh, all of our deadlines are coming up, but we will get back to you as soon as possible. Um, so that is it. We are now gonna move, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing and we will move to the Q&A portion of our session. Um, and it looks like we already have some in the chat. Uh, so let's see. Um, yeah, I can start reading these out and then uh, whoever wants to take them can take them. Uh, let's see. Um, there doesn't appear to be any place to submit a resume on the Columbia Graduate Student Portal. Is there a place to submit that? Um, I think there's there's uh, this. Is, I actually have to go back to because some of our our concentrations do actually require a resume. Um, Tori, do you want to look that up while we're moving to the next question? See if there's any way. I was already working on it and put the the answer in the chat. Oh, Tori's the best. Tori, our admissions assistant, right here. She knows better than I do for sure. Okay. Um, is there a flexible schedule or part-time track for Columbia staff? Is it possible to complete the degree while taking a maximum of two courses per semester per the tuition exemption benefit while maintaining full-time employment? Um, I mean, I can tell you that the, you can apply either full-time or part-time to the program. Um, we have had Columbia staff uh, members who have done it in the past. Um, I don't know if the faculty wants to talk about uh, the experience with that, but it is absolutely possible to do. Oh, Ron, I think you're on mute. How do I get muted? I mute myself? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say we've had a number of students that do it part-time. The one thing you might consider, I mean, again, financially, I understand the need to do that, and you should apply for it if you need it financially. But you do find that you miss the experience uh, that we was explaining with your cohorts that you're kind of stretching yourself out to maybe five semesters in, instead of three semesters. So you're not taking like the full set of courses of four, four, and then the thesis course with the same cohort. So you're interacting with different students and maybe you're not finding yourself as close to a certain group 
uh, as you're kind of mapping out your three semesters as a community. And I don't know, Hui, if you want to say anything about that, if, um, yeah, maybe not, but I would just say that. Right. Um, I'm sorry, were you asking me? Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, um, me. Yeah, I mean, part-time, there's a lot of part-time students in our cohort as well, and they're always really engraved. Um, I know that they have different schedules going on, but they're always they're always participating in a bunch of conferences that we have, the annual conferences. And it's yeah, it really depends on how you pick your schedule and your classes, but it won't really be a big issue from my perspective. Okay, next okay. question. Thank you. Um, hello to everyone. I have a question for those who will come there from abroad, people from other countries. We, we do have a, a, a very um, robust international population. Um, even though we want to make a movie in the USA, will we be returned to the country we came from after finishing school? So one thing to make sure that is clear, this is actually not the MFA program. It, this is um, this is like a an MA, it's a scholarly program, history, theory, criticism. Um, this is not a program in which you're actually coming to learn how to make movies. Um, if that's something that you're interested in, then you should um, look uh, look into the MFA in film program. Um, but in terms of being returned to the country, I know that there are um, there's something called um, OPT, optional uh, practical training that you can apply for as an international student um, that allows you to stay here. Um, longer than you would have normally. Um, so that's certainly something to look into. We have an international scholars and students office that that assists with those types of things. And we looks like she has something to add to that. Please Yay. do. Sorry. So I'm an international student as well. Um, you do have an OPT. It's a year long. And usually because we're graduating, it's a three semester program. So we're graduating in December. Usually you have to apply it by the earliest October. I just went through that process. So it was just like really fresh in my brain. Um, it takes about three months and you are legally allowed to stay after a year of your graduation. However, you have to find um, a job in 90 days, like an authorized job in order to stay for a year. And if you don't have it in 90 days, then you are obligated to leave. However, I've seen a lot of people getting jobs and internships in that area. And there's like a great, there's great resources in the community. Um, we always have a weekly newsletter about jobs and internships. And as, as Julie said, the ISSO always have like these trainings and workshops every semester at the start. So you're always welcome to just drop by and go to that, so. Okay, can you explain more about becoming a TA for a professor? What are the qualifications? How are people chosen? What's the process? Rob, so, you want to um, we, after uh, admissions, um, at the beginning of the summer, we ask for applications from incoming students if they'd like to be, you know, considered for a TA position. Um, you can imagine that um, those that um, were here the previous year are usually known by that point uh, by professors. And often they're assigned positions in the fall, um, your first semester. Uh, so a few, a few TA positions will be available in the fall, but it's more than likely that you'll find a TA position if you're qualified and if you're chosen by the professor um, or the process to become a TA in the spring and then the fall, your third semester. So again, we take um, applications for those of you that are interested, you know, in the summer uh, and fold those into the pool uh, and then uh, sort of assess them, working with the professors, working with the staff, and uh, also looking at the need. And Rob can probably address some additional information about that or about the process itself. Specifically the TA process. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, the, the process is that once you're here, that you uh, apply for TA positions. Uh, and then, um, you know, the, we go through a process of uh, selection. Uh, we would typically have, I mean, it, it tends to vary a lot, but I would say in, um, you know, in any given semester, around maybe three or four these days. Is that right, Ron? Uh, like, um, it, it varies. Um, I think some semesters we've had as many as five. 
Yeah. Uh, so, right. but at least three or four. That's right. the best. And that would be out of a cohort of between 20 and 25 students typically as well. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so th that's the general process for uh, getting um, a TA ship. Uh, I also wanted to just address, uh, Carly had a question about career outcomes from an MA program. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, the, 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 the most direct career path that moves out of any graduate degree really is towards another graduate degree, right? Towards a PhD, in other words. So an MA leads to a PhD and so on and so forth. And that's the, the most direct path. And we have a, a, a large number of students who follow that path as well, very successfully, in fact, you know, moving on for although we do not have a PhD program ourselves at Columbia. Uh, we regularly year in year out are placing scholars at the uh, place, placing students at the finest uh, um, you know, PhD programs in, you know, in the nation, in the world, really, uh, whether that's at Harvard or at University of Chicago or Berkeley and so on and so forth. And, you know, um, you know and they then in turn go on to become uh, professors of film. Uh, but that's obviously not the only destination or the only thing that an MA is, is good for. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, we have people who've also gone on to work in in film, in a variety of uh, of of other you know kind of career paths, whether that's working in uh, film preservation, film museums, uh, film retrospectives, curation, programming, festivals, and so on and so forth, all of these. Even actually, like thinking of one example, someone who went on to work for a talent agency. Uh, um, you know that uh, that if you take a kind of broad view of what a career in film and media industries might look like, that we have placed people in those career paths as well. Uh, so an MA, like the most proximate destination that it leads you to is towards a PhD, uh, but it actually is useful for a great diversity of uh, related careers. I, I also wanted to address besides the TA positions, um, Julie mentioned you know, that there are service positions in work study. But um, often those uh, work study and service positions, you're doing event planning uh, at Linfest or you're a research assistant. Um, and so you're working with uh, Professor Jane Gaines on her Women in the Silent Screen projects. So there are multiple places that you'll be placed where actually you're being sort of trained in the field or opportunities are actually located in the field uh, and not just, let's say, shoveling paper in an office. And I'm I'm responding to the person who was saying, can you work as a graduate resident director in the halls at Columbia? I'm not sure that's happened, but there are all these other opportunities and many of them are film and media related. Um, and so um, if you're you know, given a service position or you apply for a work study and you can get work study, we have a number of positions, as I say, um, that really are related to our program and related to the field uh, that you can work in. Great. Uh, we have a follow-up to the question that Rob just uh, answered about career path, but specifically with the um, emergent media concentration. Um, would, would that have a different answer or are the, the emerging emergent media concentrates doing more or less the same thing? I mean, it has a similar answer, although, of course, the, you know, the, the careers themselves are different. Uh, you know, so I think that you know, we had um, last year uh, someone in the, new, in the emergent media stream who, uh, you know, for example, went directly on to work for um, uh, the, a game, the game company that was responsible for the Bioshock franchise uh, about a decade ago, for instance, and so we're now actually working in terms of uh, scripting and narrative design for, uh, for games as well. Um, yeah, as we also have a, a student who went on to work for a company that designs interactive installations uh, whether for like museums, tourist sites, you know that that kind of thing. So, again, I think it's similar, albeit with the um, you know the 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 difference that the, the careers themselves are different. 
Um, I saw that uh, Rina Zhang had a question like, why New York City compared to big film and media capitals like LA? What about New York City stands out? Well, there's one thing that I would say that LA is great if you want to make films, uh, but the film culture in LA is not particularly rich. Uh, I, I think that outside of maybe Paris, there's no city in the world that has the richness of, uh, of film culture that you find in New York, where literally, you know, every day uh, you can, you know, aside from whatever you're learning in your classes, you can go to repertory theaters in the evening and watch, you know, not just some mainstream release that you can watch anywhere, but some uh, like an archival retrospective, you know, things like that. I'm going to share my screen with you again here at this point, uh, because this is just an example. Uh, this is the website uh, Screen Slate, uh, which like regularly uh, lists every, you know, screenings, like repertory theater programs that are happening in New York City day by day. So this is just today. Uh, so anthology film archives, uh, we have then film forum where there's film like concubine, Frederick Wiseman's new documentary, a retrospect, uh, like a restored version of a Bertrand Tavernier film, Peeping Tom, you know, and so on and so forth. Then there's film at Lincoln Center that tends to play kind of new, like art cinema releases, uh, foreign films and American independent films as you can see here, as well as it's currently got a retrospective of the films of Kiju Yoshida. Um, you know, and, and I mean, it just, it just keeps going, you know, as you can see, like this, I'm not even halfway through the website, uh, through the page at this point. So, you know, and here, like, how can you resist this? MoMA has an Ennio Morricone series. So if you just want to listen to some great soundtracks, uh, you could do that as well. There really is no, no equivalent to, uh, to film culture. Uh, than what you'll find at New York City. Uh, just to add to that, I was going to try to address that question, but Rob, you did such a better job than I ever could have done. But the uh, incredible archives here in the city, it's not only that Columbia has its rare books and manuscripts, but you have Fales Library at NYU. You saw anthology films listed there. They also have an archive. Uh, you have the New York Public Library, and they have uh, an arts collection uh, so for research, um, and then not only the cinema that you can see, every one of those institutions that I mentioned, not only screenings, but events with visiting scholars and visiting filmmakers. I mean, it's all over the city, and, and it's such a feast. You can never, you know, satisfy, you know, um, your, your need. Um, and in fact, you might fall back exhausted that there's so much uh, that you can do. Uh, and you better finish your courses, <laughs> just to say that too, you have to do your work. Um, but no, it's it's like an amazing feast here in New York City. And LA, I, you know, I like LA, but you've got public transportation here. You can travel to all of these places easier. You're not stuck on a freeway, you know, trying to get to the Margaret Herrick Library to do research. Um, it's also you know, um, a, a city that is set up for traveling to all of these various spaces uh, that Rob listed. Uh, there's, there was a question from Justin about the coursework for the Emergent Media Track, whether it's uh, purely a matter of applied theory or hands-on experience with virtual reality, AR and things. Um, I would say in response to that question that we do get to uh, engage with uh, these technologies directly, uh, albeit with, with certain limits. So VR and AR is something that we do in the new media art class all the time. Um, you know, uh, albeit that, um, you know, what we use, there are Oculus headsets, for example, that you can access through the, uh, through Barnard's IMATS Media Center and things like that. Um, you know, there are obviously limits. Uh, we don't have, you know, we're not, we're not going to make a mocap of you or anything like that. Um, you know, albeit that you could probably, th these days with the current state of AI and uh, you know, AI generated filmmaking, you could probably make a mocap of yourself anyway, just using a, a laptop. Uh, but uh, so we do get, I mean, it is, uh, I, I would say that the emergent media stream is in a way that's a little bit different from the film and media stream, kind of a little bit poised between theory on the one hand and practice on the other. 
so the students for the new media art class will work on creating kind of interactive experiences online uh, that we then will tend to curate and bring together into a website that we then make publicly accessible to other people. I, I feel like we should also address this question, and maybe we've sort of answered this, but when you say you're coming from a financial background and not a film and media studies background, we have a number of students that come from different experiences, different sort of um, educational backgrounds. And without seeing your file, you know, I can't answer that question, but you have to explain to us why this program, you know, in your application, why do you want to move from a financial background? And maybe it is that you um, are wanting to, you know, take that financial background and think about the economics of film, you know, or move into film distribution or producing. Um, and so I think um, you should apply. And, and think about that, why you want to apply to a program like this, knowing that um, maybe you didn't take, you know, intro to film or uh, film genres or um, other aspects of a national cinema, but there's a reason why you're here in this room. And I think that in your application, you need to explain that to us. All right, um, there's a question. Is there a live example of a website hosting emergent media track projects? Give me a minute. All right, let's go to the next question and we will give you a minute. <laughs> uh, maybe not something you guys are able to answer, but a concern my parents had is how much does the college how much does the college a prospective student earned their BA from affect the likelihood of entry into Columbia? So do you have to have gone to a, a fancy schmancy school? I think. No, <laughs> no. And I, I don't think I need to say any more than that. Um, we have um, students again from a range of experiences and also our international students come with a range of educational backgrounds. And we you can probably address that as well as I can. Um, no, uh, they're not coming from Harvard, Princeton, or UCLA, USC. They're coming from state schools, private schools, international schools, um, China, India, you know, Europe, uh, Latin America. So um, again, no. <laughs> um, adding on to that, um, I know Professor Greg already curated beautifully, but really I encourage everyone to like not be discouraged from your backgrounds or career and contemplating, oh, maybe I'm not a good fit because I haven't really studied a lot in my undergrad. I haven't really worked here because really it's, there are so many different people from different backgrounds and different career paths. And it's, and that's one of the beautiful things in my perspective that makes this program so unique and diverse and really um, flourishing. So definitely, there is a reason, as Professor Greg said, that you are interested in this program, and I think that's what really matters, and just curating how, like, your ways really matter to this decision is the one thing that you should focus on, and it's, I mean, I have, like, a very different career path from my cohort as well, and that really didn't become a disturbance at all, so... Rob, are you ready to go? Or if not, I'll answer this one question. Go for it, Rob. All right. Uh, so I, I um, you know, in terms of these public facing projects, let me just uh, uh, share with you two. Um, I can actually put this, I'll put them in the chat one by one, but I'll also share the screens with you. Uh, now I'm gonna share one uh, example from a few years back. And then I'm going to share with you after that, the one that we're working on right now. Uh, now, the one from a few years back, uh, I, I went back because the uh, the platform that we've been using for these is a, is, is a software called Miro uh, that uh, would it would be too complicated for me to set it up for you to have access right now. Um, but back in the day, uh, we, um, you know, we, used to use the the final project for the new media art class 
was a little bit more traditional in, in, in scholarly terms, in the sense in which it involved creating like written essays. Um, and this is a kind of example of this, where we would gather them all onto a web page. Uh, we encouraged this, this is through Medium. Uh, we encouraged uh, the students to use forms of uh, rich media. Uh, in other words, to illustrate their essays using games, uh, sorry, videos, GIFs, you know, and what have you. Uh, and so these are some of the kind of topics that, that have been uh, addressed and explored. Let's have a look at Connor's piece on Quop and uh, all sorts of pop-ups going up, um, where you know, it's an essay that then gets to be uh, illustrated with you know, uh, GIFs, YouTube videos, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of what this looked like uh, at an earlier point in history uh, in, the, uh, in the course. For now, uh, for this current year, we're working with the, the wrong uh, biennial, which is a, uh, a website that really offers, I mean, you can see here, uh, that is a, a kind of um, central hub for any number of online experiences, interactive experiences, digital art, and so on and so forth, all of which you can see here. Now, that one there, Blockchain Fairy Tales, uh, that is actually, uh, um, that's a work uh, that's come out of the Digital Storytelling Lab uh, here at Columbia University. But what we're going to have for our class this year is the, the, the resulting Miro board, uh, which will kind of be an interface that allows access into all of the different student experiences. It's actually this year, it's going to be part of the wrong biennial so that when it's done, it'll be in this list as well. So that, you know, students who graduate from our program this year will be able to say that they were, uh, that they featured at the, uh, the, uh, the, their work was at the wrong biennial for uh, 2023. Kui is looking disappointed because she didn't get that experience when she took the new media art class, um, but maybe you will. Very cool, thank you. All right, let's see how we're doing. I think some of these questions have been answered already. Let's see. I'd like to ask, does the emergent media track relate to the program's traditional area of film studies? Is it necessary to mention the applicant's connection to film when applying to this track? No, I, don't I guess so. I should let Rob answer that, but I think if you've got a connection to film, why wouldn't you mention it? I mean, you know, you want to give us a sense of your full background, but otherwise, no, you don't needed to apply to the emergent media, but Rob, you can answer that. Yeah, no, it's certainly not a, a necessary thing that we're looking for people to display their connection to film in some way. I mean, obviously there should be a connection to film in the sense that you're enthusiastic about film, uh, but we don't need to know about who you know or what your connections are and things like that. With respect to this idea of the flexibility between the two tracks, I mean, it very it is very much flexible. We will ask you to decide who you are are you film and media studies? Are you emergent media? But that's in no way prescriptive uh, of the classes that you will or will not be allowed to take. If you take emergent media, then you'll have to take the requirements for that stream, but you can also uh, take the requirements for the other stream as well. So if you wanna kind of play it and, and kind of specialize in both as it were, uh, there's certainly uh, the possibility to do that in terms of the classes that you select, but you, you will have to choose one or the other stream as your kind of official designation as it were. Um, there's an earlier question about the writing um, sample. Um, is there any advice for the writing example about film for the application? Like, what's the point for evaluating the writing? That's tough. <laughs> I've been avoiding that. Um, you know, I, I'm avoiding being blunt, but guess I should be blunt. Um, can you write? You know, and um, how do you formulate, you know, um, your framework? Um, that you're using to apply to what other object, film, even literature or new media that you're analyzing, that you're historicizing, that you're thinking about. So we're looking at, you know, how you put together 
an argument and what is the framework that you're drawing upon um, or how you review a film and what kind of depth you bring possibly to that analysis, meaning um, your sort of preparation for coming into a class beyond, you know, I like movies. I like movies too, but I want to know that you can think about movies, that you're doing more in your thinking about movies than the sense of pleasure sitting in the seat and going out and then going out and having pizza afterwards and giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down for whatever you've watched. So we're, we're looking for a kind of depth of thinking, you know, in those essays. And outside of that, it's just really hard to say. Um, but I also wanted to address while I'm talking about this, the person who said, if your grade point is um, 3.0 less, um, that we're looking at all of your materials. Um, yes, we're looking at your CV or your experience. We're looking at your writing sample. We're looking at your personal statement, how you kind of position yourself um, as to why you want to take this program. Um, and so the grade point is one thing, but all of these other things matter. And you can certainly overcome. I mean, all of us have had moments where uh, we just didn't maybe perform up to par in a semester or at a moment in life. Um, but if you can prove that you've kind of overcome that, I mean, we'll notice, we'll see this. Um, and so um, put your you know, best foot forward and put all of your attention into all of these various matters, knowing that we're looking at your whole portfolio, not just the grade. All right. Um, are there any screenwriting directing related classes an MA student can attend? We have you have you been able to take any or any of your uh, classmates? Yes, um, I did take an MFA course. Um, it was on the producing side, not necessarily screenwriting directing. But there are every time you uh, register, there's always a list of MFA courses that you're able to take. The credits are kind of different, so you have to calculate that but there really isn't an issue per se. Um, and especially if I've seen in the chat that some people are interested in having a professional career in the film industry after it, it's totally, it's very helpful because the classes that I took was business and film where you just really talk about how business is done in the film industry and you have a bunch of tests and a bunch of networking events with it. So it's really helpful. Um, yeah, and just the whole, flow between MA and theory and MFA and practice. It's amazing. I also want to add, I just read Sylvia's question on how the experience was taking both tracks. Uh, it's truly amazing, wonderful. I highly encourage everyone, honestly. Um, it's because Emerging Media, it's, it has a lot of theory and it also has a chance to really practice so many niche and upcoming emerging technologies. Um, I know Professor King talked about the finally, which I'm so sad that I'm not part of. However, last semester, the one of the courses that I took called Digital Storytelling Lab, which was under Professor Lance Wheeler, we actually had a chance to go to the Lincoln Center and present in front of Lincoln Center people, the staffs, and um, the people from LACMA, the LA Contemporary Museum and Museum of Arts. And we were we had to make a bunch of presentations under this theme that we had, and we had to use a bunch of AI, Mid Journey, Dolly, and even First Gen. If you're interested in doing that, we always have that amazing opportunity. While I was doing that, I was taking um, Professor Nico Bombat's theory class at the second semester, which really helped me expand so many depth in that practice that I'm doing. It's not really just, oh, this is a cool technology. I could use that. I mean, that's great too. But having that theory background and really um, having this philosophical questions and discussions about, okay, so why are people attracted to this? Why do people like sci-fi dystopian films? Why do people find so many uncomfortable things in AI, but get attracted to it like it's addictive so it's just it really helps you expand um your perspective and knowledge which could really only help you and you could go so many ways with it um I personally gained my insight of my thesis and my career that I'm trying to pursue so it's it's really great and honestly like the faculties are amazing the classes are amazing so why not it's great um I want to address two questions that was fabulous we one um 
music and film. Um, Professor Jen Gaines is teaching a course with uh, someone from the music department next semester on music and film. Um, and I would say in a lot of courses, and I'll speak for myself in my blockbuster cinema, music, when you're talking about blockbuster cinema, is a crucial component in kind of pumping up the energy, the kinetic ride of a blockbuster film. So I have a number of readings, you know, on music, uh, composing for the blockbuster film. And you can imagine incredible composers, John Williams and a few others who are known as, well, Steven Spielberg's composer, uh, blockbuster cinema composers. And I also wanted to go back to um, taking um, screenwriting and other courses. I don't want you to be misled though. Those courses, most of them are for the MFA students. And very often they have a very small limit because um, they're geared towards uh, the professors in the MFA working within their students that are in the MFA program. And yes, we as right, there are a few courses out there that you can take that come out of the MFA, but, but I wanna be honest with you that you can't come into our program and take a number of production courses that are not gonna be available to you through the MA. If you're really interested in production, you should apply for the MFA. All right. Um, question about Black Cinema Studies classes, or would the closest elective be in the African American Studies program? I'm sorry. Uh, we, I mean, uh, we have uh, classes in Black Film and Media uh, at the graduate level uh, within our program, uh, courtesy of Professor uh, Raquel Gates, the author of Double Negative. Uh, who joined us uh, about two years ago? Um, but you're 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 right, Tamia. That um, you know that in addition to those, there are also uh, relevant courses that are happening uh, within. We call it Triple A D S, African American and Africa Diaspora Studies, uh, which is a new department at Columbia. Uh, the you know the, those are also that's a program that also offers classes that you would be able to take uh, and. Uh, would uh, potentially count towards the degree. All right, any other questions? We're nearing the end of our session, but we can take one or two more if there's any other questions out there. May I just say one more time, um, speaking for myself, don't hesitate to reach out to me. If you have a question, just email me. Um, as we know, I'm on email way too much. Um, I think you'll get a pretty quick answer uh, from me. I'll do my best. And if I can't answer it, I'll go to Julie and Rob and we, and we'll come up with an answer. <laughs> Looks like there's a question in there for we, for we. Do you see that right at the bottom? Wondering how it felt to be part of your cohort. In my current master's, we are a cohort of three people, which can feel lonely at times. So I'm hungry to engage with more people from very different backgrounds, having interesting debates, exchanges, projects, et cetera. So I was just curious to see whether you got close to your cohort and the uni offered opportunities so as to experience a community feel, or if each person was rather on their separate path. Cheers from Bucharest, Romania. Wow. Hi, thank you for the question. Um, it's amazing. Professor King and Professor Frick might know how much I love my cohort because I always talk about it. Uh, it's really great. We have about 22 people. And because we're like in this together, there is like this very big mentality of we're in this together. So it's really supportive. Um, we do have annual MA conferences that you're not, it's not mandatory to participate, but a lot of people do because it's this place where um, every student in our core could share what they're researching on and what they want to research on. So those kind of bonding experiences and those um, academic community bonding sessions, it's really great. Uh, it's really supportive. As I said earlier on, because we are interested in the umbrella of film and media studies, however, because we have so many diverse backgrounds, not only in the country-wise, but just so many career paths and expertise in their studies, um, it's 
such an amazing thing to do and especially like during break time and we're just like dodging off each other on questions and everything and especially when we're just talking about oh like what film did you watch recently and you could go on and on about the whole theoretical foundation and historical evidence of it that you've never heard of and it's amazing uh, one of my best friends I'm sorry I'm just going on one of my best friends in my cohort they're really heavy on horror film and American history and American political propaganda it's their thing and I'm more so of very digital media TikTok AI so we always talk about that to each other and we're just fascinated by oh my god like how do you know about Reagan's Reagan's influence on horror and body like body horror film how do you know that and they always go wait how do you know about TikTok and the whole right-wing propaganda like what is that like what's going on with that and it's just this beautiful um ecosystem of people just like supporting each other and really getting to know each other and having this amazing conversations and it's really great it's really a big community but yeah yeah it's great and uh, I just uh, uh, with respect to um, just in your question about the offerings related to video games and animation, um, we don't actually have a, a regular class in animation, although, although it has been something that we've offered occasionally. The classes that we offer that are that I think the, that are the ones that that are relevant to your question are as, well. There's the new media art class, which I mentioned. Uh, but there's also a series of classes called digital storytelling. Effectively, it's digital storytelling one, digital storytelling two, digital storytelling three. They're all different in terms of their focus. Uh, digital storytelling one is focused on the history and theory of interactivity. Digital storytelling two is on the idea of building story worlds. We're also introducing for the first time next semester, but it'll be uh, it'll be available to you when you join here as well. Um, we have classes in creative coding. Uh, if you want to learn how to code and how code can be used for uh, creative projects in film or theater, that, that's also a class that you can take. Uh, so rather than there being classes kind of like specifically in animation, say, or video games, say specifically, where that kind of defines the focus of the class. And again, we do we have offered the class in animation, and over this summer we're going to be offering a class in video games as well. The tendency has been to address games and animation and those kind of things as topics within the overarching uh, pedagogical agenda of these digital storytelling classes by focusing on world building or interactivity and so on and so forth. All right. Oh, looks like there's one more question. We can take the last question. Do the digital storytelling classes address video editing? Um, no, uh, but there are, uh, I mean, there are certainly ways in which you can explore video editing, but it's not, um, it's, it's editing is not something that is uh, addressed in those classes specifically. All right, well, we are about at eight o'clock. Um, so I just wanna thank you all so much for being here, particularly those who are here in the middle of the night. <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time out. Um, if you have any further questions, please reach out to our office. You can also reach out to the faculty. Their emails are in the chat. Um, and uh, yes, and th thank you for being here. We hope to see your application uh, on February 1st or beforehand. Best of luck and happy holidays. <laughs>